Hey everybody, Nobleness here. I hear a lot of the D-Wave computer and programming reality, and I wanted to give you guys a rundown on um, stuff like binary, computer programming, computer processing, some of the D-Wave stuff, and I just feel the need that you know, a great majority of people, for good reason, you know, don't have a clue as to what's going on inside a computer. <clears throat> and if more people understood, they could get a better idea of what may or may not be going on. Um, again, as always, I compare, I com <laughs> prepared like complete crap, and so this is going to be a below low grade video, so bear with me. Okay, starting off. Binary code. So everybody knows ones and zeros and zeros and ones. And it's going to control the world. No, not really. What is a one and a zero? What is binary code? Binary code is a counting system. It's a two base counting system. Currently, everybody recognizes on planet Earth that we have a ten base counting system. What that means is we have ten symbols. We have starting with zero up to number nine. And for each object or each count, we use a symbol. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, and up. Once we run out of symbols, we get to the number nine. We bump up to, you know, a higher digit or a placement beforehand and start the symbols all over again. That's it. It's a ten base counting system. Binary code is a two base counting system. So there's a zero for zero, a one for one. You just ran out of symbols, so you bump it up. So three is actually represented by a one and a zero. Four is represented by a one and a one. Five is represented by a one zero zero. So essentially, a binary code or counting system is just that, a two-base counting system. It's a representation of a number. That is what it is. And in computer programming is all based off of numbers. So obviously if you have a number like 10,000 and something, this binary number is going to get very, 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 very long in order to represent 10,000 and something. Incredibly long. But there's an advantage to using a binary counting system when it comes to electronics and computers. And a few reasons why it comes in really handy. There's some tricks that they pull off and uh, it's actually pretty creative and ingenious what humans have done. So <clears throat> inside a computer, a one or on a line or on a data bus, just some wires or in a processing chip, a 1 is represented by voltage, typically 5 volts. There's some different chips that, that are used, but the most common, I think the most common, is the 5 volts. So 1 is 5 volts, 0 is 0 volts. So you have five, So when you have uh, data entering into a computer on a, on a wire, you have 5 volts, 0 volts, 5 volts, 0 volts, 5, 5, 5, 0, 0, 0. And there's a break within, so that you know there's 5 zeros in a row, or let's say five ones in a row, it's broken up by timing. So your timing has to be perfect on the data going in and the chip receiving it. There has to be timers. and It has to be perfect because there's no zero between the two fives if there's no not supposed to be a zero. Um, it's timed perfectly so that the data is received properly. So, in, so the first thing they had done when it comes to um, using a 5 or 0 volts is cr the creation of a flip-flop. That's basically the key. And a flip-flop, we got a little picture of something that would represent that. Quite possibly. Oh, there's my numbers. Here we go. So a flip-flop, you can actually, it's made out of solid state material. You can actually make one out of two relays, and a relay is just um, an electromagnetic magnet 
right? Everybody knows what that is. You get a piece of wire wrapped around a nail, throw a battery on it, you have a magnet. So a relay would have a magnet portion and then basically a hinge, a spring-loaded hinge. And when it energizes, you energize the coil, this, the hinge pulls back against the spring. And then when there's no voltage or no energy, or no magnetic flux, the spring flips back. So literally, you can take two relays, wire them within each other, pretty much what you see here. Actually, this is done with the four kind of concept, and this is done in a solid state sense, but it's a crisscrossing of a wiring. And so what happens is, um, as far as what you would see by playing with it, if you had... Um, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, so what happens is that they, they can work against each other. So when you put a, I shouldn't say against or with, all depending on how you look at that, but when you add a, some power, some energy, both coils energize in an opposite manner and pull both of the hinged portion back, the switches back, and it'll remain that way once you remove the electricity. And it's done that just like opposing magnets, so that they'll, they'll actually like it'll lock in. And so like literally, there is I don't know if literally <laughs> there's energy held. I consider I look at it as a spark. It literally can hold a little spark in there, and that's essentially what's done. It's holding a little bit of energy. And in the case of relays, it's doing it in an electromagnetic form or magnetic form that they work against each other and hold each other in, in place, even though there's no more electricity there. So if you were to play with this by hand, you make yourself a little flip-flop, whether it be um, done with relays or whether it be done with solid-state material. Solid-state material is just, it's a little more complicated, but it's the same idea. It's, it's just materials that react to a current and uh, in a kind of electromagnetic way, I guess. <laughs> I shouldn't say that for for certain, but anyway, it's a very similar type of manner. So if you were to play with this and you have the two little wires coming out of your flip-flop and you have five volts in your hand, two wires, a positive and a negative, and you touch it, you know, it, and, and pull it away, you can measure with your meter and you'll measure five volts. It'll get stuck in there in some sense. You touch it again with the five volts, you put your meter there again, and you're going to measure zero volts. So essentially what you're doing is this is a form of storage. You're literally storing a little bit of electricity. This represents a one. <laughs> this is how complicated things, things can get, or how, how multiple things are within computers is just phenomenal. Um, so what's done then is these flip-flops are wired in a series form or a parallel form so that, let's say one, one in a series form, so that if you take, and then of course timing got to be correct too, so you have information going in, one, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero, zero, and you're, let's say you're holding these little wires and you're touching it really quick, and the timing on the outside has to be the anticipated timing on the inside, obviously there's, there's side circuitry to go with that, and these, these, this little spark or this bit of energy that's representing a one will literally chug along like a choo-choo train or like almost a domino effect and carry down the line. So now you're storing uh, a registry of, of data. And, so, and all it is is ones or zeros, but actually all it is is, a, is some energy or not some energy in each little flip-flop. And then you can wire these in a sort of a parallel sort of setup and um, it'll perform an adding. It'll, per, it'll perform in an adding way. And this is why binary, only having two different symbols, comes in really handy. Is, is a good trick. Because you can actually wire them up and down from one another. I'm keeping this very simple. Trust me, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> completely explaining this. I'm just trying to get, let you understand how, kind of how this works. So you think about each one of these sections here as a flip-flop, and then you can wire them up in, in parallel, like up and down from one another, and it will literally add two two ones. Will be uh, it's it's kind of confusing. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this so simple. So basically, you can wire these up so that they will add, and all and all of the, the adding is is just making two zeros a zero or 
two ones, um, a one on the next one, but a zero below. So it just it makes it possible to add numbers, um, to add a two base system. And so this is basically what all computers, all computer programming is based from. It's based from adding two numbers together. Once you can add two numbers together, you can also subtract two numbers. And in the case of binary code, which another big amazing little trick that they had came up with, is that if you take the lower, you know, say you're going to add two numbers together, if you take the lower number, completely invert it, make all the one zeros, all the zero ones, you add it together and ignore the last, the highest digit, it's the same as subtracting. Believe it or not, it works. I'm not going to try to explain it all out to you right now. I'd probably screw up trying. But it's an amazing little trick that they had done. And so now, with computer, you know, with flip-flops or whatever, you can add, you can subtract. With adding, you can multiply. With subtraction, you can divide. And you can build all your mathematics off of it. And so everything, absolutely everything that happens in a computer, as far as processing goes, is based from adding a two-base counting system. That's it. Absolutely everything is based from that. And so you can imagine how, how much numbers must be going on, right? Because in order to represent something else, you just need a bit bigger number. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the, the volume of ones and zeros is absolutely incredible, right? Um, in, in simple forms, you can think of on a computer screen, you know, you got little pixels, and, and each pixel is an is a X and a Y position, and then each, each pixel is also a color, and that color can be represented by another number. And if you have data coming in, you know, if you see, if, if the processor sees this number happen, do this. If this happens, do that. And this and that and that and this. And everything is based off it. It's actually phenomenal how much little tiny shit is going on. That all adds up to be a whole lot of big shit. <laughs> For lack of a better terminology. Um, very amazing. Absolutely incredible. All computer programming is based off of this. Everything. Now, of course, a computer programmer isn't using ones and zeros. A computer programmer is using program programs in order to program. Um, I had done, through my schooling, I had done microprocessing, PLC, programming, C++ programming, which is a very complicated uh, program to make programs. And even as a young kid, I did basic programming, which is, you know, if this happens, do that, if and then, and or, and all this stuff. Um, that gives you a slight idea of how computer programming and processing works. Of course, there's a massive amount more to it. And in a computer, you have your processor, which is taking data in. So you have input devices. You have processing going on with it. So you have all your ones and zeros coming in. Mind you, if this is an input device, could be a microphone, you know, it could be music, it could be, I don't know, cameras, whatever, it takes in data. But of course, it's not taking in, um, I guess it could be depending on how complicated your device is on the outside, but it's typically pumping in ones and zeros, right? In some cases, it may put in an analog signal, like music, but it would hit, before it ever got to the processor, it would have to convert that into uh, digital information, ones and zeros. So you have input devices, you have your processor, which is just adding and subtracting crap like mad, and then you have output devices like your display screen or a speaker. But in order for your processor to really do a lot, or if you want to play a game or something, you need memory. Most of you understand that one. You have a hard drive. But your hard drive is like a record player. So in order to get anywhere within the program or anywhere within the ones and zeros, you got to start at the beginning and play through, just like a record, an old school record. So a processor is would be very, very, very slow. It wouldn't be very, wouldn't a computer would be very slow if you ran everything off of a hard drive by reading and writing to a hard drive or a record. So what you do, what the computer does is take a program from your hard drive, 
load it up into your main memory, and now you can access any point within that program at any moment in time. Now your processor can actually use that program. Really, this doesn't show, your main memory would actually be divided into two sections. You would have, uh, this is your RAM, so you have your hard drive, you have your RAM, random access memory, and you would have your cache. Your cache is another form of memory. So the cache is more like very uh, temporary memory. So when your processor snags some information in order to know what to do with this data coming in, it adds numbers, subtracts numbers, and gets, uh, you know, an equal. Well, equal what? It doesn't need to do anything with that number right now, so it'll stick it in, in the cache very temporarily, but it's going to need that, it's going to need that uh, data back again at any moment in time. So it's a very temporary, temporary memory, whereas your RAM is a little bit more of the um, program loaded up. And so, blah, 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 it does all of its crap and outputs a picture, outputs a sound. Um, next, I would like to give you a general idea. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best general idea. Let's say of how things is data and analog, or should say uh, digital or analog. Basically, the main difference between digital and analog is that digital, as I just kind of shown and explained, is all represented by ones and zeros. It's all represented by a number. That's it, right? So, in, in analog, it isn't a number, it's a constant flow. So, let's say somebody's running along and, you know, at any given point, you know, a person's taking steps when they run, and each step is another position, could be another number. But so that's the reality that that would be digital. Each step is another number. But in reality, they're not going from one step to another. There are all those places in between, an infinite amount of positions in between. That's analog. That's real life. So real life is a constant flow of whatever. Analog is a constant, uninterrupted flow of whatever is happening, whether it be data, sound. I shouldn't say data, whether it be sound or movement, life, reality. You need to stick that one in there. And so what we've done, not me, but what they have done with computers, and, and actually even just music is very complicated in order to turn it to a digital music. So what they've done is taken sampling. So you have, a, instead of a sound wave, like you would get off a nice record player, they, it needs to be converted into into data. And so by measuring a voltage, or, you know, taking a ref reference as, into vo as voltage, you need a reference point, and you can say, oh, well, this is so many volts, and this is so many volts, and this is so many volts, and now we got this number, and we got this number, and we got this number, and then it can be stored. But realistically, you're only sampling. you, you got all these gaps in between. And the better the sampling, the better sounding music you're actually going to create. Right? See, so more and more sampling, closer, closer to analog, but really it's still digital. And really the music we listen to nowadays is not analog, it's digital. A lot of, when we're listening to stuff, I believe it's still the case, don't, don't hold me to it, they might have come up with a little bit of tricks um, with some circuitry to take a pure signal, like, oh, to your wall, our, our electricity out of the wall is a constant signal. Maybe they found ways just to take it and manipulate it. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Actually, I know that uh, exists, but I, I think they refuse to do in computers because they damn well know that it's far nicer, far healthier, literally far healthier to listen to analog music than digital music. Because digital music, you're actually listening to, in some cases, 80-90% dead sound. And the rest of the sound's turning off and on right quick. In a phone call on a cell phone, that's exactly what's going on. They used to have analog uh, lines and then they got digital lines and digital lines can hold many conversations on one one pure signal but really what they did they cut it all up into damn pieces <laughs> it isn't so bad with the telephone I shouldn't complain <clears throat> genius though mind you complete genius and they're able to put many 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 conversations on one signal and they've done this by taking <clears throat> by taking this and calling this here, old user, this is call A, and this is call B, and this is call C, 
and this is call whatever, and then they start over. This is call A, this is call B, this is call C, and then start over at call A. So you're listening, in this case, let's say, you're listening to one-third, or two-thirds of dead air, and you're listening to one-third if it's actually your conversation. Luckily, they, uh, they don't let you hear the other conversations, or everything would just be mumbo-jumbled together. Um, and it's actually really high now. I don't know what they're up to about, uh, what the hell. I think they were at 19 conversations per, per line at one point. 26 maybe, I don't know. So like quite literally. They, they might have done some stuff to kind of merge sounds together. I'm sure they, they have. Um, kind of synthetically fill in the blanks. But basically there's a whole lot more dead, dead air you're listening to than you are to the conversation. Just everything happens so, so fast your ear and your brain consciously doesn't pick up on it. Of course, many would debate subconsciously. Of course, it damn well knows. It's listening to utter freaking chaos <laughs> or a bunch of off and on. So that gives you an idea of, of digital and analog and sampling and turning um, just a simple sound wave of a little bit of music into data is an incredible amount of data to do this, right? It has to be done, sampling has to be done so much, so quickly, that you don't notice. The, the rate of speed and the amount of data is just absolutely incredible. And we were doing that in the 80s, <laughs> or whatever, I don't know, somewhere around there. Um, let's see where I am at. So, I guess I, this would bring me to... Hmm, let's go to quantum. Actually, I'm going to come back to that part. We will go to quantum. I got a little piece of a video. So I explained to you binary code, um, programming, how it's stored, kind of, the processing. Um, so that's all regular computer stuff right there. Everyday computer. And now I'll take you into... Uh, how the quantum concept kind of takes off from there is literally what's done. It's, it's a step further is what it is. Now it's a big step, I'll give it that, but it's still the same concept and I'm just going to let you listen to a minute or two of a video so you can understand that. Um, this is a great video actually. Uh, you can see it there and I'll just play a little segment for you. But really, anyone that's interested or you're into this kind of stuff or you can kind of get an idea what's happening, you should watch this video. Fantastic video. Uh, this is one of the main ones that, that I learned about the, the quantum computers and, and what's going on. So go ahead and play a clip of that so you can get an idea so I don't have to explain and you'll believe me. <laughs> I'll give you a simple example of something called a quantum gate because we're going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, so most of the people in this room, you know, that when you build complex electronics, I'll have some simple functions. Let's take the simplest one called a NOT gate. You put a binary zero in, you get a one. You put a one in, you get a zero. It's a simple function. There's a class of simple functions like AND, OR, NOT, NOR. You put them together in complex arrangements and you can build arbitrary logic and all the great stuff that our computers do today, okay? Um, quantum mechanical version of that um, you can encode information on a lot of different physical systems. It could be a transistor, it used to be you know, gear wheels, mechanical calculators, or an abacus. And what people first started looking at was, can I, as I miniaturize these transistors, you know, can I use individual atoms and molecules as computing elements? This is how it started. So if I have an atom, there's the proton and electron energy levels, I could call the first orbital a zero, and I could call the second energy level a one. And we know that if we send in light of the right frequency, I can make a transition from here to here. So sending a pulse of light into an atom that was in the ground state and going to the first excited state means I started with a 1, I did an operation, I, I, me, I started with a 0, I got a 1. That's a not gate. It also turns out that if you're in the excited state and you send in a photon, you'll get stimulated emission, the electron will drop back down to that other state, a 1 becomes a 0. That's a NOT gate. So I've implemented a NOT gate with an atom, okay, just by shining light on it. But here's the interesting part. There's a time associated with this thing to go from here to here. 
the electron can't be in between. What it actually does is when you shine that light on the atom, you can think about the electron being here in the zero state, and as that light turns on, it sort of fades out of existence, it fades up here, and now it's a one. Leave the light on again, it fades back to a zero. So if you leave the light on for half the time it takes to make that transition, it's in both places at once. That's a quantum gate. It's called a Hadamard gate. You put a zero in, and basically the way you implement this is I have the atom, I start there, I shine it for half the time it takes to make a transition, and what comes out is this thing in this weird state of being a zero and one at the same time, which is a quantum bit or a qubit. Okay? And so what people who think about this sort of gate-like model for quantum computing now, in ion traps, this is a cartoon, imagine you had a whole bunch of atoms like that. And now for each atom I have a laser, so I can excite it. I can have that electron in the ground state. I can build a register out of this. I shine light on an atom for half the time it takes to make a transition, and I put it in this strange state of being a zero and one at the same time. And I do that for every one of them. So here's where you start getting an idea of the power of quantum computing as traditionally thought about. Now, this single register that has eight bits, in a classical register where I had transistors that were either zero or one, I could have two to the eighth different possible. But at any given snapshot in time, I only have one of these. In this quantum register, by just shining that light for half the time for each of those, um, it will be in a state that encodes all of those registers simultaneously. It's all zeros, it's all ones, it's every combination simultaneously. Okay? Now imagine you made a 300-bit register, and you can see what happens. Every time you add a qubit, you get a factor of two. So the number of possibilities grows exponentially. So if I had a 300-bit register, I would have two to the 300 possible combinations stored in a single register simultaneously. And that's more numbers than there are particles in the universe. These are the kind of things you hear. This is the exciting part. <laughs> These are the kind of things you hear. <laughs> More than all the particles in the universe. Well, that's bullshit. And that's exactly why he said, that's the kind of things you hear. Because that's completely it's not true. It's just nonsensical. <laughs> His mama would slap him for saying that, if she had a clue. <laughs> so, um... The reason why is the amount of particles in the universe. The universe is expanding at faster than the speed of light, and it's a sphere. So the bigger it gets, the even more volume there is to it. <laughs> so obviously that's just stupid as a ball sack right there. But anyhow, it is true, if you had to say, you know, it's an astronomical amount of, of um, outcomes or processing that can take place more than imaginable yeah sure it definitely is and, that, and that's a catch so there was the, the kind of the main thing I wanted to show you with this quantum uh, computing piece is it is still based off of ones and zeros it's still based off of adding it's still based off of pro the same style of processing kind of actually I should say a different style but nonetheless, it's still based off of numbers and, and, and mathematics. And the, the amazing thing, really, with, with the, this quantum computer is that every single uh, register is both a 1 and a 0 at the same time. So when you start adding and subtracting your data, you get every possible outcome at the end. It's some sort of mind-bending concept I can only kind of fathom to conceive. But either way, as he goes on to explain in the film, the trick is is to figure out which answer you want to get and how do you get it. I don't even know what they did. But nonetheless, it's still mathematics. It's still binary code, which is representing a number, which is just used to do math. Um, that's it. It's an amazing processor, is what it is, that can process beyond belief, really, beyond imaginability. Um, so, so one, maybe one could theorize, okay, so a processor could, could, um, you know, a quantum processor could do, could calculate everything in the universe, or in, as let's say, on planet Earth, could calculate everything in planet Earth, just for a very simple way of putting it. I know that hardly makes sense. 
Um, but the problem is, my first problem I have with that is, uh, how does it get the data coming in? You know, you have all of these, well, I'll get to this in a, in a minute, but you, first of all, you need the data coming in. Where, where's your sensors? What, what's, what's, what's turning the sensor, for one, where's your sensors out into reality? What's converting that into a number and then getting it to your computer? <laughs> Two, the biggest problem, I don't know, actually there's a massive big, many big problems. Another massive problem is that a processor, in order to, let's say that this input could be done, then in order, a processor, you can't just process as on, on, on the fly. Um, you need to basically load it into memory so that it can be analyzed. The processor can decide what needs to be changed, give it a new number, and then output it. Well, the big problem there is you could, you, you, could, you might be able to create enough memory on the face of the earth <laughs> to represent the data needed just to um, try to represent and have enough sampling to represent a couple of atoms worth worth of quantum particles. Like the, the amount of quantum, the amount of particles in the universe is one thing. There's trillions. Well, there's trillions upon trillions of quantum particles inside of every other particle, inside of every regular electron or neutron or proton. Like massive amounts, trillions upon trillions, it's ridiculous. So let's say you actually could have little sensors out there that could somehow <laughs> turn your data into numbers, get it to the processor. Let's say there's some absolute miracle way that you could store it so it can be analyzed and changed to decide what to change. And then you need to output it. Well, you don't just spit it out into thin air. How on, they, they would have to be some phenomenal technology in order to affect the energy and the frequencies within every single quantum particle, which is trillions upon trillions of quantum particles inside of every other particle in the world. And as I mentioned on another one of my, my videos, um, just uh, let's say on, on average, just a single gram of particles, or sorry, a single gram of atoms, which which all has a, a good handful of particles to make up one atom, just one gram of, of atoms, if you were to spread it across the entire planet, uh, one thin layer, just one single layer, you would, you would have over five billion, five billion atoms for every square inch on the planet. <laughs> Are you guys starting to get a grasp on how many quantum particles we must be dealing with here, right? It's absolutely incredible. And so now I've just, I've just shown you, you know, how much, it, it's just absolutely incredible, people. And that is only scratching the surface, because you can't just take every quantum particle and say, oh, it's a one or a zero. A quantum particle is made up of energy. And this is basically just theorized, as far as we know. You know, maybe they've gotten a little further. But inside of every quantum particle, you have basically theorized two vortexes. And so now, <laughs> instead of sampling from a single little wave like music, you need a sample from this 3D, two 3D freaking vortexes of energy that is constantly changing in frequencies and energy, and at the same time is affected by every other quantum particle around it, and affected by every one of us as we view it and experience it. It's absolutely phenomenal, people. Like, beyond any belief. And that's why in my messaging when I say <laughs> that it's an absolute joke that we can program reality. I'm telling you, it's an absolute joke, absolutely inconceivably impossible, on magnitudes beyond belief. Without a doubt, I'll put my life on it absolutely impossible. Now I mean that in a conventional form or even a quantum computer form. I mean that uh, conventionally, I mean that by numbers representing stuff. And that's how all processing's done. That's how all processing's done with quantum computers. 
by numbers. Now, there's possibilities, perhaps, that, you know, I can theorize or, or, or think or consider the possibility that they have processors out there that are able to, um, uh, I don't even know how to put it, that can kind of get close to that, let's say, in, in some way, in a limited form of our planet Earth. I don't, I don't even know how to put all that. It's still pretty much inconceivable, but let's say they can get a processor to do it. But we, but still, you're missing the input, you're missing the sensories and, and the input data, you're missing the memory, and you're missing the output, which is going to affect the reality and all of the energies and frequencies and constantly changing energies and frequencies within reality. So, but the interesting part, and here's what they don't want you to realize, is that, and, and of course, you know, I'm going to have to go a, a pinch heebie-jeebie on you, but, you know, if, if um, it, it's possible for the human mind, with the energy that we can output through our vibes, through our, I don't know, our aurora, I don't know, through, through our consciousness and our awareness, we can output energy and vibrations, which are frequencies. Frequency is just simply an, a, a fluctuation of, of almost off and on, but more or less highs and lows of energy, right? So different speeds of energies, different, different amplitudes or magnitudes of energies, and the frequencies is, is the fluctuation of those. So it's possible that at humans, quite when we will, it almost very much is really possible. It's just science won't won't work with it and won't look at it. But I'm sure many of you guys, uh, as well as I, can can understand enough or, or kind of believe enough or see and or heard about enough in the in in history that humans can affect a little bit of reality around them. Right? A simple little kind of a a, a spellish thing, or you know whether you're going to affect how somebody feels just by the way you feel. Um, uh, hypnosis, would that fit into there? Mm -hmm, I'm not so sure. But, but that's, that could maybe happen, right? Our energy fluctuations that we, that's controlled by our mind or our soul, perhaps, or our subconscious, perhaps, can affect the energies out in reality around us. Because that's, this is one of the things things quantum mechanics has come to prove to us and has proven that everything is made up of energy not matter there's no such thing as solid matter we're wrong there's no such thing as a vacuum we're wrong it's all made up of quantum particles quantum particles make up other things that seem like solid matter to us but it's not it's energy and so now because of quantum science i know that given enough <laughs> enough conscious understanding, you could say belief, that's a bad term, um, an, enough conscious knowing, I can walk through a wall. Why? Because I'm made up of energy, and the wall's made up for energy, up of energy. So I just got to make sure that the energies don't intermix, you know? Some people question whether Dave, David Copperfield actually did that in the, the Wall of China. Maybe, right? Um, of course, he doesn't look at it as a science if he did do it. So, so what, this, what does this mean? That means that <laughs> for the fact that we can directly work with energies and it all not be represented with freaking numbers, to, to put this into perspective, that means that some simple animal, as simple as a fruit fly, can make a quantum computer look like a joke. And I'm not even kidding people. That means that we are far more than any stupid processor, any stupid freaking computer that they can design. It's not physically possible for them to do anything that will ever come near what a human being is capable of. Never physically can they do that. Every single little bit of matter that they use for memory storage or to make up a processor is taking up trillions and trillions of more quantum particles just to do it. It's insane, right? We are far more than any computer will ever be. No computer will ever be what we are. This is absolutely ridiculous, and they don't want you to know that. They want you to think that a computer is far smarter, quote-unquote, which is stupid in a term to even be thinking about, but they want you to think that a computer is far smarter than a fruit fly because a fruit fly can't say 2 plus 2 is 4. A fruit fly doesn't give a shit about 2 or 2 or 4, and nor does it need to know. 
fruit fly needs to know that it goes over there to get something to eat or whatever to reproduce. I guess they don't really eat, do they? Whatever they do. I don't know. <laughs> That's my point. Life is far more than any computer will ever be. Ever, ever. And I think I'll leave it at that. I have a little video that I wanted to go over and kind of make fun of Buddy and, and tell you how the propaganda works. It's, it's a lot of truth and a bit of propaganda, but I'll get to that video, maybe a short little segment there. Uh, a video probably a lot of you had seen on quantum computing uh, from the D-Wave uh, CEO guy, I think it was. Um, kind of interesting. I'm going to play a little bit of that video and put in my two cents worth. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening. I hope you guys got a vague idea as to what the hell I just said. <laughs> and uh, definitely ask any questions you want. I'll try to answer them. Um, I just wanted to get that out there because I know that a lot of people are lost when it comes to computers and I don't blame them. It's just a box, you know. Like I think Joe Rogan took put it when you when you take a picture. I don't know what the hell's going on there. It could be little elves paintbrushes in there. He doesn't freaking know. That's right. Who the hell knows, right? But uh, I know. I I got a damn good idea. I I learned about it and and whatnot. And I'm really I'm happy I did. In this case, uh, it allowed me to to learn a little bit about quantum computing and what that is. And so the term quantum, therefore. All they're referring to is the fact that they can take a particle and put it in an in-between state, or a particle can be in two places at once, or represent two different things at once. Um, one of the other things you guys may have heard about is quantum entanglement, and that's basically you can kind of shake two particles together or something. You can entangle them, take them to two different places in the universe. You 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 know kick one in the ass, and the other one's ass is, ass will hurt at the same time, as they'll they'll both react. Um, that's a really interesting one, very very interesting, and probably will be used for extreme uh, long distance communication at some point in the future, which it actually is used now. China apparently put up a satellite with quantum. Um, capability using quantum entanglement, which means they're not beaming a signal down. They're actually, it's just blinking, let's say blinking off and on or shaking or not shaking in order to represent a one or a zero. Again, it's just using binary type of data. It's using numbers to represent data. But in this case, they're just transmitting the information through quantum entanglement. Awesome, amazing little trick. Um, but there you go, guys. Hopefully somebody learned something and I didn't completely waste my breath. I think I'm kind of happy with the way that went. And uh, I'll try to say something else to you another time. <laughs> Take care, guys. Keep your minds together and uh, love one another. Peace.